hopefully you caught my introduction, I'll just summarize. Um, so today's presentation, or this webinar, is on the North American Multimodal Ensemble, uh, both the research projects, some of the uh, research projects that we sponsored here at MAP, as well as the operational perspective that we'll be hearing from the director of the Condor Prediction Center, Dave DeWitt. So uh, I mentioned the webinar is being recorded, and we'll have it on our uh, webinar webpage after the fact, along with PDF of the presentation. And um, there'll be time for Q&A after each talk. So with that, um, sorry for that feedback, but uh, I'd like to now introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Kathleen Pijan. Uh, Kathy is an assistant professor in the Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Earth Sciences at George Mason University, uh, and a research scientist in the Center for Ocean Land Atmosphere Studies, or COLA. Kathy's research focuses on climate variability, predictability, and prediction on sub-seasonal to seasonal time scales using state-of-the-art coupled atmosphere-ocean general circulation models. Her research goal is to improve predictions at sub-seasonal to seasonal time scales through better understanding of climate variability and use of information from model predictions. After earning her PhD in climate dynamics at George Mason University, uh, Kathy worked as a research scientist at the University of Colorado uh, series, and she was a recent co-chair of the U.S. CLIBAR Predictability Predictions and Applications Interface Panel and a co-PI on the NMME and SUBEX Subseasonal Prediction Experiment Project. Kathy, thanks very much for joining today. Thank you, Heather. Now let me just transfer control to you, and you can go ahead and share your screen and begin your presentation whenever you're ready. I click share screen. Or yep, we see your screen. screen. Both everyone? Yep, we see it. Great. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much, Heather, and for the invitation to present um, a MAP webinar. Uh, the project I'm talking about today um, is on assessing the fidelity of predictability estimates. And this work comes out of a, um, a MAP funded NME evaluation project. Um, the work was done in collaboration with Tim Del Sol, Emily Becker, and Teresa Ciceroni, and it's been submitted to the NME Special Issue in Climate Dynamics. So one of the challenges we have in, um, in prediction is that um, we're trying to predict a chaotic system. So, and we can't um, perfectly observe that system, so no matter how good our forecast systems become, we're always going to have a limit to our ability to make predictions due to this initial condition uncertainty. So in order to, de to determine um, kind of the goals for our forecast systems, um, we really like to know what is this limit of predictability and how close are we to that limit given the current systems that we have. So the, um, before I move on, I want to say that, um, you know, to sort of describe how is it that we go about um, determining what that limit is, typically um, predictability estimates are made using perfect model um, predictability calculations. So what we do is we assume that we have a perfect model, um, and then we see how well does that model predict itself. And the reason we make this perfect model um, assumption is that we really want to know what is this upper limit to prediction just due to initial condition uncertainty, while ignoring the fact that we have uncertainty due to model errors. Um, so an example of what these perfect model predictability estimates look like um, is shown here for the NINO 3-4 index, and each of the different lines um, represents a different model from the NME reforecast uh, data set. And so on the x-axis you see the lead time in months, the y-axis the correlation um, of how well the model predicted themselves. And so the problem we have with these perfect model predictability estimates is that we actually don't have perfect models. So we get a wide range of predictability estimates um, depending on which models we have. So if we look at, say, six months, for example, we have a range of predictability estimates from about 0.8 um, up to about 0.95. So in order to understand what is our upper limit of um, predictability, we kind of need to know which of these estimates are most realistic. And then to determine how close we are to that upper limit, what we typically do is we compare the perfect model um, predictability estimate with the actual skill um, 
and then we say the difference between those two is our gap or our kind of what we're trying to do in terms of improving our prediction systems. Um, so this shows you an example of that, again, for NINO 3.4 from the enemy models. Um, each model is just labeled with a letter. Um, I'm not focusing on comparing the models, so um, it doesn't really matter which model is which. But what you can see is um, when you compare the actual skill in blue with the perfect model skill um, in red, um, we have a wide range of estimates of what our gaps are um, in prediction skill, um, and that also sort of varies um, by lead time. So really, again, we want to know which of these predictability estimates um, are most is most representative of the predictability of the true climate system, which one of them um, do, we, do we believe as our upper limit of skill? Um, this is challenging to do because we don't actually know the predictability of the true climate system. Um, and so, and it's, it's very difficult, um, maybe even impossible, to, um, to know the answer to this question um, with only a single model or observations. So that's where um, the NME will come in um, when we look at um, how we can use that system to answer this question. So if we want to know which predictability estimate is most representative um, of the predictability of the true climate system, we might think that there are some characteristics of our prediction systems that we can compare with characteristics of, of observations um, and give us some hint or idea of which ones are most realistic. And so we have three metrics um, that we look at in this study for assessing the fidelity of the predictability estimates. Um, these metrics have been used um, in a couple of other studies. Um, the spread error ratio, the autocorrelation, and the actual skill. So for the spread error ratio, um, we expect that if a model is, a system is perfectly reliable, that the spread is representative of the uncertainty, so the spread and the error should grow together. So for a perfect model with an infinite, member, an infinite number of ensemble members, the spread error should be one. Um, in a finite ensemble system, it should be very close to one. And so we might think that if the spread is less than the error, then the model system is under dispersive, and it might overestimate predictability. Um, the second metric, autocorrelation, is a measure of persistence. So we might think that if a model is more persistent than observations, um, then it would better predict itself than it should, and it might overestimate predictability. And then finally, um, the actual skill, model with the highest actual skill is the system closest to observations on average. Um, so we might think that it has uh, a better representation of the observed system, and therefore its predictability estimates might be most realistic. So we'll look at each of these um, metrics um, for uh, the enemy system and just see kind of what they look like. So I'm looking again at NINO 3.4 and we're looking at the spread error relationship um, as a function of lead time. And again, each of the lines is a different model from the enemy we forecast. And so what you can see from this is that all of the models um, have a spread error ratio less than one. Um, this means that the spread um, is smaller than the error, so the models are under dispersive relative to their error. So you might assume that these models are all um, going to overestimate predictability. Um, but perhaps you might think that the ones with a spread error closer to one um, will, less, will overestimate less um, than the models, for example, that have a spread error ratio much less than one. In terms of the autocorrelation, um, showing here the autocorrelation for each of the models, and then the observations um, is shown in the dashed gray line. Um, and we might think perhaps that these models here um, with an autocorrelation higher than observations um, are going to overestimate predictability, and maybe the ones here um, with all the correlation less um, than the observations would underestimate predictability. And then again, for the skill, we have models with more skill, models with less. Maybe the ones with more skill um, have a better estimate of predictability, and the ones with less skill have a poor estimate of predictability. So previous studies have looked at these um, metrics and use them to argue that one model's predictability estimate should be better than another's, um, but they weren't actually able to quantitatively demonstrate that these metrics can tell us anything about the fidelity of a predictability estimate. So in our case, that's where the NME comes in. We're going to use the NME reforecast data set 
um, in an idealized framework where we choose each model in turn as the truth and then test whether the three metrics can tell us how well a model estimates the predictability of the truth. So to give you a visual picture of that, um, I'm showing you here a scatter plot of the perfect model predictability estimates of the various individual models on the x-axis and a model selected as truth on the y-axis. In this case, we selected, we're showing the example of NCEPT CFS2 as the truth. And so what you can see is for any given um, lead time indicated by the numbers, um, the CFS, what we've chosen as truth, has only one predictability estimate. But then you have a range of predictabilities um, from the different models. And you can see that some models have higher predictability estimates than CFS and some have lower. But the question we're going to be asking is whether we could identify these models here that have predictability estimates very close to the truth um, based on the three metrics of spread error, autocorrelation, and skill. So we'll take a look at that in this situation where we've chosen the NCEP CFS2 model as the truth, and we'll look at it for, th for four different lead times. And again, um, focusing on Nino 3.4. So if we look here at a scatter plot between the errors and um, representing the spread error relationship, where error is, them, is um, calculated as model minus truth, versus the errors in representing predictability, um, we might expect that the models um, that have no error in their spread error relationship would have no error in their predictability. And we might expect that models that have um, that underdo the, S the spread error relationship might um, overestimate predictability and vice versa. So we might expect kind of a line, a linear relationship going like this, if the spread error relationship tells us anything about errors in predictability. And so the re um, regression lines have been drawn for each of the four different um, lead times in different colors. And you can see that for the short um, lead time, zero month and three month, we see some evidence that maybe there's a relationship between errors and spread error and errors in predictability. And there are square values are shown here. If we look at the same thing for autocorrelation, we might expect that models that have a high, um, higher autocorrelation than observed might overestimate predictability, and those with a lower autocorrelation than observed might underestimate predictability. So we might expect a linear relationship that goes like this. Um, but we don't see that in this case. And then finally, for the skill, um, we might expect models with high skill, um, with models with high skill would have little error in estimating predictability, and models that have low skill would uh, more poorly represent um, the predictability. So we might expect a relationship that goes like this. And we still see any evidence that there's a relationship um, in this case. So this is a situation where the, we've applied these metrics with the NCIP CFS model um, as the truth. But we can also um, take each model in turn as the truth and test these metrics. So we'll do that here. And so again, the spread error relationship, now we've included all models in turn as the truth. And you see again some evidence that there's possibly a relationship between spread error um, errors and errors in estimating predictability um, with our squared values of about 0.55, but um, that seems to really only hold for the shortest lead times. We look at autocorrelation with all the models, and we don't see any evidence of a relationship between errors in autocorrelation and errors in predictability. And similarly with skill, we also don't see a relationship. So we know that predictability varies um, by region, it varies by variable. Um, and so maybe for Nino 3.4, these metrics um, aren't particularly useful, but um, maybe they can tell us something more um, if we look at some other um, variables and regions, um, such as temperature and precipitation over land. And so I'm showing you here some regions that we've selected to look at, and these are the Georgia et al. regions that have been mapped onto the NMME one degree by one degree grid. And in the interest of time, I'll focus on just these three regions here primarily, um, over CONUS, Western North America, Central North America, and Eastern North America. And so if we look at the scatter plots, here I'm showing precipitation, um, we can look at the scatter plots for each of the different um, metrics 
um, that the metrics are indicated by the row, and for each of the different regions, which are indicated by the columns. And so again, if we look at spread error, we see this relationship potentially between errors and spread error um, at the shortest lead times um, with errors in predictability. If we look at autocorrelation across the different regions, um, we see that sometimes there's a hint that autocorrelation maybe can tell us something, um, but it's not robust across lead times and it's not robust across regions. And then when we look at the skill, um, we see that there's just no relationship there between um, the model skill and errors in predictability. And then now looking at temperature, the same idea, um, the same information comes out. We see a relationship with spread error at the shortest lead time, no robust relationship um, with autocorrelation, and no um, information coming from the skill about which a predictability estimate is most realistic. So to summarize, we have the spread error ratio is telling us something about errors in predictability, but it only works at the shortest, seems to tell us anything at the shortest lead times. So perhaps it's more useful for weather and subseasonal time scales, and that's something that we're looking at um, currently with the enemy phase two data, um, and we'll um, hopefully be looking at in the sub X data as well. We don't see a robust relationship across regions or lead times for autocorrelation, and we don't see any information coming from the skill. So I'll conclude um, with a few more slides, but I want to come back basically to um, to do that, come back to my very first slide, which is that we want to know what is this limit of predictability, and we want to know how close our current prediction systems are to that limit. And since these metrics didn't tell us anything about the fidelity of predictability estimates, um, we weren't able to identify a specific limit or a specific um, definition of the gaps in prediction skill. So I'm going to put out there that I think for now the best we can do is to provide a range of predictability estimates. And I'll give you um, a couple of slides showing you um, how I think we can do that. So I'm showing you here these three different regions over CONUS again, Western North America, Central North America, and Eastern North America. I'm showing you um, precipitation on the left and temperature on the right. And the gray area shows you the range of predictability estimates you get from all of the models in the NMME. The solid line shows you the model at each shows you the skill at each lead time for the best model, so it may not be the same for each lead time, may, may not be the same model for each lead time. Um, and then the dashed line is showing you the skill of the multi-model ensemble, which is always very close to the best, um, the best model. And so we can look at this range of skill provided by the NMME, our range of predictability estimates provided by the NMME, and say whether our skill falls anywhere within that range or whether it's clearly um, below that range, um, indicating that perhaps we have a gap in skill, for example, in precipitation in East, Eastern North America. And we can expand that idea to um, the rest of the regions um, defined by the Georgia regions and just, hold on, I lost the, uh, I lost the last slide there, sorry about that. So last slide here, we can sort of expand that idea to the Georgia regions. Um, and um, if we do that for temperature, we find that most of the times our skill is within that range of predictability estimates. And I'm showing you here for precipitation that there are several regions where it's very clear that our um, current skill is well below the range of predictability estimates provided by the NMME. And those are Australia, Western Africa, Eastern Africa, and Southeastern Asia, where we have the potential for improving skill um, into, rate, um, into um, levels that are actually um, probably fairly useful relative to what the current skill is. So um, on that ray of hope that we have, um, we're doing well in many regions, but we have the potential to improve in some others, um, that's where I'll end. Thank you. Great, Kathy. Thanks so much. Now I want to open it up for uh, questions. So to ask a question, you'll see that blue um, tab at the top of, this, of your screen uh, in WebEx. It says, right now it says viewing Kathy Pijon's screen. So if you click on that and then click the participants button and then the raise hand logo, uh, that will um, 
put a little hand icon next to your name, and I'll know that you have a question, and I can unmute you. And you can also chat any questions you have in the um, chat box. Okay, so I see that there's a question from Lisa Goddard. Lisa, uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah, am I unmuted? Oh. Yes, you're unmuted. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Kathy. That was that was great. I just had a question about that final slide, and maybe I didn't understand um, the predictability range. Was that the defined by the skill of the models against other models? Because um, otherwise, I didn't understand how the best model was below the gray bar ever. Um, so in that last slide, I'm I'm going back to the real world and saying how does our actual skill um, compare with our range of predictability estimates? Um, so in actual skill, the best skill and the enemy skill, that's compared to observations. Does that answer your and question? The predictability and the predictability and estimates predictability. are between models. Yes, yeah, so the predictability estimates are the perfect model predictability estimates of all the enemy models. So you would get Got a range. It. Some models have higher, some models have lower. Okay, thank you. Back there. Thanks, Lisa. Okay, so right now I don't see any more questions. We might have time at the end for questions. So um, with that, thank you very much, Kathy. Great presentation. Thanks, Heather. Okay, so now I'll give control over to uh, Michael Alexander, who's our next speaker. He's a research meteorologist at the Physical Sciences Division of uh, NOAA's Earth System Research Laboratory in Boulder, Colorado. Mike currently has three main research foci, air-sea ice interactions, processes that influence moisture transport and heavy precipitation over the western United States, and climate change, including its impacts on marine ecosystems. Mike has also worked closely with marine biologists to study how climate change may impact fish, such as the Atlantic croaker and river herring. Over the last three to four years, he has been examining the prediction of ocean conditions with a focus on sea surface temperatures near the coast. And for this work, he uses the NMME as well as empirical methods. Mike has a, a his bachelor's in atmospheric science from Cornell University and a master's and PhD in atmospheric and oceanic sciences, sciences from uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And Mike, uh, looks like your screen is being shared as we speak. Yep, so we can see your screen. And go ahead whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thanks everyone for uh, listening in today. Um, so this is a group effort. Um, the names listed on the bottom of the, uh, people with various expertise to tackle this problem. So. Um, a lot of the work uh, has been done looking at the physical system, like sea surface temperature, uh, precipitation, um, air temperature over land, like Kathy talked about, looking at how the NME forecasts those things. And we're going to look at sea surface temperature, but we're going to look in coastal regions um, where most of the fishing goes on and they're very productive uh, ecosystems. So uh, there has been defined large marine ecosystems, or LMEs. Um, around the world, and what's shown here are the ones around the North America. Um, LMEs are kind of large coherent areas along the continental margins. Um, they're sort of defined based on a number of factors, both physical like ocean currents and, and the bathymetry of the bottom, and uh, are the ecosystems similar or somewhat similar in those regions. So for example, the California current region is quite a large one that pretty much extends all along the west coast of the United States. So we're going to use the NMME uh, to look at forecast skill. Um, we're using the um, phase one. Um, so there was 14 models that had data from 1982 to 2002, and all that data was uh, put on a one degree latitude longitude grid. So uh, we estimate the skill by first averaging ensembles from the individual models. So if the individual models, they weren't just a single forecast. Um, I guess they range anywhere from like six to 25 uh, simulations with one, one individual model. Um, and then we average the models to create a multi-model mean um, hindcast. Uh, they were, uh, in order to do this, you need to bias correct um, the forecast based on lead month and uh, initialization month. 
um, to remove the drift in the models, and we're comparing skill by um, looking at the model forecasts compared to the quarter degree Reynolds uh, OI SST data set. And again, we're going to focus on skill in these large marine ecosystem regions around the U.S. Okay, so um, here's uh, various regions uh, listed on the top of each area, and what you're looking at is a, kind of a skill matrix of the anomaly correlations um, for each uh, initialization month, which is shown along the x-axis, and then the lead time shown along the y-axis. The y -axis. So if you look, usually um, there's the, the darkest reds, which means the highest skill uh, at short lead times. Um, but then for, for many regions, there's higher skill uh, at, at various leads, even out to a year in some locations. Um, and one can see sometimes clear diagonals. So, for example, in this Gulf of Mexico region, there's an area of low, low skill, uh, low diagonal. And usually that's uh, uh, you're looking at the same month that's being forecasted. Um, so, for example, in September, there's stronger skill out into winter you know, target month of, say, February or March, and, uh, and that just continues as you go up, and so you're looking at longer forecasts with higher skill. So that's a, the target region skill is when you see the um, high or low correlations along a diagonal. Um, where there's uh, these gray dots, oops, there's, um, uh, that shows uh, uh, skill at the 5% level, and then when there's sort of these upward triangles, that's, that's significant skill above persistence. And so it's clear you can see there, there's definitely is forecast skill for SSTs in these various regions, like Gulf of Alaska, California Current, um, areas where there's less skill are both uh, along the northeast uh, U.S. and, the, and the, the Scotian Shelf, which is kind of uh, near the Gulf of Maine. So that, um, all those plots were for the ensemble average forecast. And then this is a demonstration of just one region. So this is the same kind of plots for the uh, California current system along the west coast. So here you see the just the skill from persistence. And so um, there's a fair bit of skill just going out, especially from the winter months. Um, and, and then you can see, but there's a, a lack of skill, say, out at eight or 10 months lead times for forecast starting in uh, August or September. Um, and the mod, but the models do definitely show skill in the ensemble mean, and then one can look at uh, the various models. These are the two Canadian models, which to, tend to do quite well in this region. Um, and some of the models have, uh, even though they're they're better in some regions, they're they might not be quite as good in this area, um, such as the GFDL uh, GFDL model for this particular region. Okay, so here is a way we can compare um, the forecasts across the individual models shown in these colors. The dashed line is um, persistence, and the black line is the ensemble average. Um, so for all the areas, you can see a decay in skill as you go out. So this is um, averaging across all the different initialization months, but then you're looking at the forecast skill going out as a function of lead time. And you can see pretty much uh, for almost all the, um, all the areas and all the leads, the ensemble mean is, and is the best or is near the best for pretty much all the regions. Um, there's a couple exceptions. When the overall forecasts are poor, then all the models do poorly and the ensemble drops off quickly too. And there, there you might as well use persistence, say, for the Scotian Shelf area. But like I say, for most areas, um, the, the individual models are better than persistence, and the ensemble mean is, is best, even at um, leads going out to, say, 11 months. Okay, so this is a, just an overall summary of the various skill um, across the different, the 14 different models, and the ensemble mean is shown on the top and persistence on the bottom, and these different areas, um, large marine ecosystems around the U.S. Shown these are as an anomaly correlation and, and uh, root mean square error. Um, and what jumps out at you first is maybe that um, the thing that is more discriminatory is the region. So, for example, 
pretty much all the models do fairly well in the Gulf of Alaska compared to the southeast U.S. Um, but there are some areas where there's definitely uh, differences uh, um, across regions uh, for the same model. And then, in general, the ensemble mean um, does give the best forecast compared to even the, the best these, these best models say near the top. Um, there can be cases where it's, it's useful also to look at root mean square error. So, for example, if um, if, if the, this is more a measure, if the anomaly correlation is more a measure of how well it's getting the sine right, uh, less on the magnitude of the error, and then root mean square error can give you an estimate of what the, the magnitude of the error is. And I won't go into details. Um, at the end, I'll show where the, these are pub, you know, uh, papers are published or submitted, and, and one can scare these for the regions of interest and models of interest. Okay, so so far we've looked at deterministic measures of, of skill, the anomaly correlation, or root mean square error, um, but one can also look at the probability of forecasts. For example, um, is the temperature anomaly in the lowest tercile, lowest third, is it in the middle or the highest highest third? Um, and there's a, a number of different ways to estimate the, how well uh, the models are um, forecasting that probability. Um, here we're using the Breyer score uh, as an estimate. Um, and here's where the ensemble really comes out, um, that you can see that the, the ensemble with all the different members does a much better job than any other model in terms of this probability of getting the, the forecast right, both for the, the cold tercile and, and the warm tercile. So we can kind of dig down a little deeper into the Breyer score. You can decomp uh, decompose it into what's called the reliability, which um, Kathy had discussed before, resolution and uncertainty. So the reliability is how well the, the um, a priori predictive probability forecast isn't coincides with what actually observed um, for that event, the observed frequency. The resolution indicates how well the forecast distinguishes situations with dis distinctly different frequencies of occurrence. And the uncertainty just measures the variability of observations and is independent of the forecast. If we look a little bit at the reliability um, using a similar metric to what Kathy discussed before, um, here we're showing the RMS error minus the spread. Um, so ideally it should be zero, the difference between those two, the error and the spread should, should be the same. So the spread is the, 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 in, the forecast from the, the ensembles, ensemble members. So uh, here you can see that the RMS error is generally greater than the spread for all the individual models. So that's indicating that they're under dispersive or sometimes called overconfident. And, but if you use all the members in the ensemble, you get fairly close close to zero. So, um, in other words, that uh, you're encompassing the the, observ the observations are basically within the ensemble spread, which is is what you're hoping for. Um, uh, another way to look at it is sometimes this uh, shown on the right here is these reliability diagrams. So this is the reliability of four month forecast. And for a reliable forecast, what you're hoping is that the probability of the forecast will match the actual probability that um, that occurred in nature. And so that would basically be a straight line along here, a one-to-one -one ratio. And so you can see that that for the upper tercile or the, the warmest third, that basically the ensemble of all the different uh, models was fairly close to that, where if you went to the individual model, they were um, much less reliable, which means they, in this case, they showed um, uh, that the probability of event occurring was much more likely in the model shown on the x-axis than occurred occurred in nature. And the same pretty much held true for the lower tercile as well. And although I won't show it, uh, uh, using the ensemble of all the different models also includes the, the resolution that's separating different kinds of events. As well as, as well as the reliability. Okay, so moving on and focusing now more on the, on the California current system. Um, we've shown this plot before here on the bottom. This is for the entire area, uh, the entire CCS. Um, 
So these are the initialization months and the leads. And we can see there's sort of persistence scale and then scale out here, um, which would be kind of winter time after uh, forecasts were, say, initialized in summer. And this is a work that Mike Jaycox led. So in addition to the whole large region, um, clearly what happens off, say, Washington can be pretty different than what happens off Southern California. And so uh, Mike split out um, the, the forecast into uh, northern, central, and southern regions. And this shows you the, the corresponding skill for those three areas. Um, and somewhat surprisingly, the uh, northern system appeared to have the most skill. Um, and our, our guess is in some additional work is that basically you're seeing the skill due to the strengthening of the Aleutian low and it's having the strongest impact um, here off the northern part of the CCS rather than further south. And I'll, I'll get into that a little more uh, down the road. So we're going to look at uh, the processes that influence predictability in this um, California current system region. Um, so this is just showing the correlation be, between the temperature anomalies averaged over that area with uh, SST anomalies over the rest of the Pacific. Um, and at zero lead, you really clearly see the ENSO signal. So if it's warm here off California, it's warm throughout the tropical Pacific and ringed by cold anomalies in the western part of the basin. And what these other panels are showing are the same correlations, but the the forecasts lead at different times, so three, six, and nine months. And even at nine months lead, you can still see that, um, that there's still correlation with that ENSO signal. So this is uh, nice evidence that um, at least a good chunk of your predictability or some of your predictability is coming from ENSO. Um, and there's probably two routes for that, and one of them is uh, through w ocean waves that could move up along the coast, and the other one is changing the strength of the atmospheric circulation, and during El Nino events, you tend to strengthen the Aleutian low, and then that can affect the winds along the coast of California, um, both changing upwelling and changing the heat flux through the surface. So um, what, what we've done is we've subtracted the persistence uh, forecast and then looked at the remaining uh, uh, skill and so you can see once you remove persistence there, the skill that pops out is, is later in the forecast. Um, so if you started in summer, it would be what, course, what occurs later in uh, the, the following winter. And then if you isolate the ENSO events that occurred and looked at their skill uh, from the 1982 through 2010 period, you basically recover most of all years. And in ENSO neutral years, this, this really there's really no additional skill. Um, so here we're showing the, the skill for this, this CCS. Um, basically, for uh, if we look at this middle panel, um, each of these gray lines is an individual member of the NMME. The, the dashed line is persistence. Um, the black line is the ensemble mean. And the, the, the sort of purplish line is is basically a simple regression model that includes both persistence and the ENSO signal. And you can see that you can, you can recover much of the skill um, just from that simple model. Um, if we do look out at the month that the forecast is for, then there's some discrimination in that. Here the ensemble mean um, shown as the black line for forecasts that are, uh, uh, are verified in, in the winter months, say February, March, April, there's there's definitely more skill from the ensemble mean than most of the models and also this simple system. But over the rest of the year, that's um, not, not necessarily the case. So this, this argues that we, we definitely can look for, for more improvement um, in, in forecasting the CCS, either from more sophisticated statistical models or by improving um, representation of physics in, in that region. So uh, one kind of interesting application of, of using these SST forecasts um, for the California uh, uh, current region is for uh, Pacific sardines. Um, so the, the, the sardines, the, for most fisheries, um, they're based just on 
essentially a stock assessment or how, might, how many fish there are at different ages. Um, and for sardines, they also use a, um, some SST information. Um, so what was the sea surface temperature in the previous three seasons? And that goes into their uh, assessment of what might happen to the fishery in the future. So um, we set up a, a, an experiment to test different uses of the SST forecast from the NMME. So um, one of them is basically uh, just a, a set fishing rate. It doesn't depend on temperature. Um, that's what's called HE1. HD2 is sort of the current method where it uses the SST uh, in the past, so not any kind of forecast. This HG3 is um, HG stands for harvest guideline or how much how much fish to catch. So um, so use in late winter, early spring, um, we use the forecast from the NMME, and that goes in the, into the prediction of um, that that year's uh, um, what would be allowed to be harvested. Harvested, and the last one is you use the the forecast of SST and and include that into the the model of the fishery, the stock assessment, and then that model predicts what the biomass would be the the following year, so one year one year out. So you're you're including not only predictions of SST but also predictions of the biomass from the biological model, and so then these are the different results. Um, but shown on the left are these four different methods. Um, and the, the, the mean stock biomass is basically how many fish there are. And you can see that um, basically this fourth method, one that allows you to not only use the SST prediction, uh, but also then including that in the, in the biological prediction, um, gives you the best amount of fish basically in the system and also the best yield. So you get both you know, more fish you can take and, and more fish in the system. So this was sort of a nice demonstration of, of using um, SST predictions in, in, a, in a, a current model that is used to estimate how much sardines to, to take. So if we think about prediction systems going forward for that would include both ecosystems as well as um, physical systems, we've sort of been focusing on this, this part here. Um, but then for for the biology, um, usually they need much finer resolution, so that might use the boundary conditions from our global system and putting that into a regional ocean model. Um, they also need to include um, biogeochemical data, like how many how much nutrients is in the system, how much how much um, phyto, phytoplankton are in the system, um, and so then that is included into the regional model. And then from that high resolution, say a model off the California current to use in higher trophic levels. So higher trophic levels are animals that are further up the food chain and ones that we would probably be um, interested in, in fishing for. So um, you can see that this is, these are long-term goals to, to kind of get to this level. One also could do from high resolution models, global models from the start, or from perhaps um, statistical methods, um, but there's, both a lot of engineering and a lot of um, methods to, to get to, to this level where we want to go. But these kind of systems are in the process of, of being developed. So as the first step, we explored seasonal SST forecasts from the enemy climate models. Um, the GCMs have skill in predicting SST, but that varied widely by region. Um, there's definitely skill in the California current system and in, in subregions, and it, currently that, that skill mainly comes from both persistence and the ENSO signal. Um, we found that the multimodel mean generally gave the best forecast, that, though not necessarily for all regions all the time. And that increase in skill in large ensemble, that definitely improved probability forecast. And a number of steps are needed to go from sort of the physical modeling that um, enemy has done to fine scale ecosystem forecast. So we'd like to thank the CPO for supporting uh, this work and that actually led to a number of publications. Um, this, this, uh, this one's been uh, accepted with minor revisions. This one has just been accepted um, and the other two are published. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Mike, great. Thanks so much. Um, so. Uh, we have some time for questions. Online, you can raise your hand. Uh,
in the participants box, click the right hand icon. I don't know if there are any questions in the room. I don't see any questions coming in, so we'll hold off. I have a question oh, for Mike. Dan has a question. Hey, Mike, this is Dan Barry. Um, I just had a question about the dependence on the regions. I mean, it seemed to some extent like maybe there's a dependence on the size of the forecast region, like there's maybe an aggregation of skill or something if you have a larger region versus a smaller region. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, so there's probably a number of factors, and I think that's one of them. The southeast U.S. is a pretty narrow region. You're also pretty close to the Gulf Stream, which these, you know, moderately coarse resolution models have trouble um, getting the details of. So one of them is size of the region. The other one might be, are you in an area that has a large-scale signal, say, and so impacts that region or, or not? Um, and what other factors can I think of? So there might also be, from a persistence standpoint, if you're in an area that has um, deep ocean mixed layers, um, the SST anomalies tend to stick around longer, um, so that also can affect persistence. So it's probably a number of factors, but definitely size is, is one of them. Yeah, it seemed like in particular, like the Gulf of Mexico is a pretty big region, but the skill was fairly low comparably for the Gulf. Like, is that the mesoscale circulations in the Gulf? And yeah, so I guess the Gulf is sort of an in between. It seems like it definitely in like um, predictions out out uh, a, a year in one winter. There's this this gap in. In, in kind of the forecast where there's some scale on either side. Um, it's something I guess we would have to go and look at to see to see if we could diagnose exactly why um, the forecasts were, were um, departing from observations. Hmm. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Mike. Great talk. Um, so now our next presenter is Jason Furtado. Jason, you should have screen sharing privileges, so you can try to pull up your presentation while I'm introducing you. So Jason is an assistant professor in the School of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma and an affiliate of the South Central Climate Science Center. Jason joined the School of Meteorology faculty in August of 2015. Prior to that appointment, Jason was a climate scientist with AER in Lexington, Massachusetts, and a lecturer at Boston University. His research focuses on large-scale climate dynamics and the weather-climate interface, including stratospheric tropospheric coupling, tropical and north Pacific decadal climate variability, sub-seasonal to seasonal forecasting, and large-scale climate change. Jason, Jason holds a Bachelor of Science in Meteorology and Mathematics from Linden State, a Master's in Atmospheric Science from Colorado State, and a PhD in Earth and Atmospheric Science from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Okay, so Jason, we can see your desktop, so if you just go into uh, full screen mode there, go ahead whenever you're ready. Great. Thanks, Heather, for organizing this webinar, and thank you, everyone, uh, for coming. Um, today I want to talk about um, a project uh, that um, we've been working on and basically trying to diagnose how well the NMME Phase two models um, can simulate sudden stratospheric warming events and their impact on surface weather uh, and climate. Um, this is a project um, that I'm working with uh, Judah Cohen at AER and uh, Emily Becker and Dan Collins at the um, NOAA CTC. <clears throat> so sort of the motivation for this is um, looking at this mode of variability, the mode of variability, the northern annular mode. And just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, we can think of it basically as these north-south vacillations uh, in the polar jet stream. And so here I have an image from Thompson and Wallace in 2001. On the left is uh, the positive phase of the NAM, where the jet stream is um, for, uh, further poleward. Um, and you can see that that kind of locks up cold air at the higher latitudes. And so uh, lots of zonal flow is seen in the bottom panel, lots of more zonal um, warmer in the middle latitudes. Uh, this stretches actually all the way to Europe and Asia as well. Uh, during the negative phase is when some of the more interesting stuff starts to happen, uh, especially during the winter time. Uh, the jet stream um, sort of relaxes towards the equator. Really, we can think about that as it becomes a little bit more wavy. Um, and so we get we can start developing these large blocks, especially in the North Atlantic and in the uh, Alaskan region. And this allows for cold air outbreaks, um, extreme weather events, snowstorms, et cetera, to really uh, wreak havoc in the mid-latitudes. So getting a handle on trying to get 
um, the predictions on this sort of phase and amplitude of this NAM uh, are really uh, one of the keys for subseasonal weather predictions, especially for uh, the winter time. Well, in the troposphere, of course, things um, uh, sort of evolve and devolve very quickly on the order of about 10 days or so. But in the stratosphere, um, this is a reservoir that has a lot more memory. So I'm showing kind of two images. On um, the left is the 500 millibar wind field. Um, so again, you can see somewhat of an annular structure, but lots of waves in there. And then on the right is the same northern annular mode, but looked at at 10 millibars. And so you can clearly see um, here's our polar vortex. Um, so kind of clean, but also just to highlight that this northern annular mode extends through the column. So uh, trying to predict something at the bottom, um, actually there's uh, predictability if we look above. So looking at the stratosphere, which is a slower evolving uh, medium that can give us information about the bottom. And just to highlight that again, uh, this is an image from Baldwin and Dunkerton in 2001, uh, kind of a seminal figure now in stratosphere troposphere coupling, where they looked at composites of uh, uh, times when the polar vortex was weak versus times when the polar vortex was strong, and then did a composite of that northern annular mode index uh, in pressure for each pressure level from 10 to 1,000. And so I think it's uh, fairly clear here that in the positive lag, so after the weak vortex or even after the strong vortex, we see same signed anomalies that propagate downward through the stratosphere and then into the troposphere. And so one, one key thing here is that we're getting same sign. So negative in the stratosphere yields negative in the troposphere as well, so that wavier pattern that I discussed. But the other thing also is to note the time scale. So you can see that here time zero is when the vortex is stronger or the weakest, and it takes time to propagate downwards. But even after the vortex here starts to say recover on the top panel, the negative NAM signature remains in the troposphere for 30, 60, up to 70 days. So again, this is a chance to really extend predictability um, into sort of the four week to eight week uh, time frame using the state of the stratosphere. So what we're gonna look at is the NMME2 models uh, to try to get a handle and see how well that they can possibly forecast these sudden stratospheric warming events and their subsequent impacts on the surface. And so here I have a table of um, the uh, models that were provided to the NMME2 uh, unfortunately, for stratospheric levels, we had a lot of limited data. Um, and so we were only actually able to get um, level or stratospheric levels from three models, the Canadian CM3, CM4, and then the NCAR CCSM4. Um, I'd like to thank Ben and Eric and uh, the rest of the folks who really uh, worked with me over the last, you know, nine, 12 months to really start uh, get some of this data um, and help me to uh, get, through the, get through some of this research. So today I'm gonna to present um, sort of two of the three things that we've been looking at. One is looking at fundamental NAM characteristics. So how well do these models actually characterize and capture that annular mode structure? Because if we're trying to predict it, these models better be able to do something um, and, and, and reproduce something that's seen in the real world. So we're gonna look at that. Um, and then we're gonna take a look at simulated uh, sun stratospheric warming. So these aren't necessarily uh, ones that we've observed in nature, but ones that the model simulates and see how uh, sort of what they project that should happen after sudden stratospheric warming events. Um, sort of the third phase of this, which is ongoing right now, is looking at observed, these are, um, excuse me, uh, sudden stratospheric warming, and then trying to see how well the models predicted those. And that's, um, that's like I said, is kind of ongoing now that we have uh, most, of the, most of the output for that. <clears throat> so um, the, the observations, uh, quote unquote, is gonna come from the error interim reanalysis. That's where we're gonna diagnose our sun stratospheric warming events as well. Um, we're gonna focus on November through March initial initializations. This is when in the Northern Hemisphere, the stratosphere and troposphere coupling, the dynamical coupling season occurs. Uh, we're gonna focus on daily mean fields. And um, just for definitions here, the Northern, northern Annular Mode will be um, the first EOF of geopotential height at each pressure level with the leading principal component time series being what, what we'll call the NAM index at that level. Now, in the models, um, just kind of avoid, avoid some of the model biases and how they capture these uh, modes, what I've done is the NAM is actually calculated, or the NAM index from the models is actually calculated by taking model geopotential height fields and projecting them onto the uh, NAM characteristic pattern from the observation. So we're comparing now how well the model captures the observed or what should be what the NAM structure is. 
So part one, again, is looking at fundamental characteristics of this NAM in the uh, NMME2 models. So the first here is a uh, regression of sea level pressure onto the AO index, which is the NAM index at uh, 1,000 millibars. And so I have four panels here, and this will be a common theme throughout the presentation. So error interim on the top left, and then the three models, uh, CAM-CM3, CAM-CM4, and CCSM4. And so if you look at these pretty quickly, um, they look fairly, fairly well, although some of the details are important for us to note. Uh, number one is if we look in the Atlantic sector. So for the NAM, we have a major loading center here in the Atlantic, the uh, projects onto the, northern, the uh, North Atlantic oscillation. But in the models, it seems like the North Atlantic or that North Atlantic oscillation signature seems to be a little east biased, so more into Europe versus here over the Azorean and um, Icelandic areas. The second difference is that we have a much stronger Pacific loading center that comes out of the model. So the models are much stronger in the Pacific, whereas in the observations, the major loading actually happens in the Atlantic sector. And I think this is going to play a role when we start seeing some of these diagnostics in terms of jet latitude and persistence going on with the model. So the next is looking at uh, the autocorrelation function. So how well is the AO index correlated with itself out to positive lag? So the black line here is for, uh, from, the, from the reanalysis, and, you can, and the brown line is the 1 over E time scale. And so you can see that we have right about that about 12-day kind of characteristic time scale for the uh, AO. Um, the two Canadian models seem to parallel the observations very well. The CCSM4 is a little quicker, a little hastier there on getting to the 1 over E line uh, by about two or three days. Um, but overall, I would say if we're in that sort of 0 to 12 day, we're doing okay in the models ex except for maybe the CCSM4. So this is for the AO in any condition, basically. But now what we'd like to do is actually look at these different regimes. So again, the positive regime would be that poleward displaced jet stream. The negative regime would be that wavier um, jet stream, more equatorward, and again, chances for cold air outbreaks, extreme weather. Um, and other literature has shown that the negative phase of the AO has a longer sort of duration. So the negative AO state tends to last longer than a positive AO state. And so we can see that here um, again. So here what I'm doing is a frequency diagram versus the duration. So basically taking days when we had the negative AO and positive AO that lasted at least three days and seeing how long it took uh, or how long uh, that, that uh, negative AO uh, lasted. So here we can see, for example, that we have a big bump here, the 10 to 15 to 20 day, whereas in the positive it decays away very quickly and we have very little frequency um, for positive AO days, so very little cases where the, where the positive AO stays in its current state for more than, say, 15 days versus the negative. You can see in the observation, I mean, excuse me, in the models that they don't capture this sort of bump or persistence uh, uh, in the negative AO regime, that they decay away basically almost at the same rate, a little bit higher, but not as high as the observation. So the models themselves do not have that persistence of the negative AO state that we observe in nature. Um, looking at the max jet latitude, so this is looking at where is the maximum jet stream across the Atlantic Basin um, and sort of in a histogram diagram. So on the left is for the observations, and you can see that the mean latitude is about 49 degrees north, but there's quite a bit of a spread. So, you know, we do see that these vacillations that go north and south a lot uh, within observations, very widespread there. But in the models, the distribution is much narrower. In fact, really tight um, between about, you know, 42 to maybe 58 or 59, certainly not the range that we're seeing um, in the, in the reanalysis. So again, that jet stream is pretty steady there and it's not moving around within the models too much. And so that may be actually impacting some of the impacts from, say, that NAO um, plots that I showed earlier. Okay, so how about in the stratosphere? What does the stratospheric vortex look like? So here I'm showing uh, regressions of 50 millibar heights onto that near surface um, NAM index. And so again, most of the models have an annular-like annual structure, um, <clears throat> perhaps some difference in terms of where the centers are, but overall we are seeing kind of that annular polar vortex structure related to the surface NAM um, within, within the model. How about uh, variability within that polar vortex. So here what we're doing is we're looking at the standard deviation of the zonal mean zonal wind at 60 north, 
10 millibars, which is essentially a measure of how strong the pole vortex is. So in the observation, the left bar, excuse me, the rightmost bar, we can see uh, deviations of about 18 meters per second. So, you know, the vortex in the northern hemisphere tends to be during the wintertime, again, has these warming episodes, breakdown of the vortex, strengthening of the vortex, so a lot of variability. In the models, we're seeing about 20 to 30 percent less variability. Um, and the lowest actually is in the CCSM4, which um, is actually the model out of the three that are analyzed that actually has the least frequent uh, sudden stratospheric warming frequency. It only averages roughly about six for the entire 30 plus year record uh, versus about 20 that we see in the observation. So very low variability within the CCSM4 uh, polar vortex. And uh, so this is sort of known to happen for a lot of these low top models. And, um, there's been a couple of papers, um, one by Charlton Perez et al. in 2013, and then a paper um, I wrote with um, with, with co-authors at CPC and AER again, uh, looking at the CMIP-5 models, where this was also a problem with low variability. Okay, so we've taken a look at sort of these fundamental characteristics of the NAM. And now what we'd like to do is now go to the second part and look at simulated sudden stratospheric warming events within the model. And their post and precursors and also a post uh, sun stratospheric warming impacts. So <clears throat> for here, we're going to define a major sun stratospheric warming as was done in Charlton Pavani in 2007 and Butler and Pavani in 2011. So a major warming is going to be when the wind, zonal mean zonal wind at 60 north, 10 millibars during November through March um, goes uh, less than zero. So it goes easterly. Okay. For the error interim, like I mentioned, there's about 20 events that occur between 1982 and 2013. In the models, we have 10 runs for each of the models. We have uh, 10 ensemble members per model. And so um, rather than getting, you know, uh, like I said, um, the Canadian models get about 18 to 20 um, per, per run. Um, so that would be, you know, sort of like 200 that we would be analyzing. So to kind of take away some of that, um, you know, much more samples from the models, what I did was um, I applied this definition per ensemble member um, with the starting month of November, but then I only chose 10 simulated SSWs per run. So then I would get a sample size of 100 to compare. Yes, it's a lot more than the 20 from the error interim, but it's a lot better than looking at, um, you know, sort of 200 plus from each of the models. Um, and I, again, like I said, less from the CCSM4 model because it just doesn't have any SSW frequency. In fact, it's about a factor of three less than what the Canadian models had. So again, roughly about six to seven per that 30 plus year run per ensemble member. Okay, so first we're gonna look at what do conditions look like preceding, so before a major sun stress for a warming event, what does the troposphere look like? And so this is again getting at the idea of predictability. So, you know, if we see a certain characteristic pattern, can we predict whether or not a sun stratospheric warming is imminent to occur? And again, after that, then see what the post impacts will be and extend our predictability. So the first panel here is the observation. And so you can see a couple of key features here. One is uh, this ridging that occurs across, across Eurasia, across the Kara Sea area, and then associated dipole or troughing across the Northwest Pacific and um, high pressure strength and subtropical high across the Pacific here. So this is a typical days, 30 to 15 days before an SSW, this is what we typically see. When we go into the models and we pick out the model simulated SSWs and look at the precursor signals, uh, we can see that we do see some common signals in the Canadian model. We do see this uh, negative North Pacific oscillation pattern here that shows up in the model. We also do see some signs of a little bit of ridging here across, across the Kara Sea area, um, not, as uh, not as prevalent as in the observation. The CCSM4, though, uh, I, I don't know how to interpret that. <laughs> it's sort of like everything's the opposite sign there. Uh, sort of does not have that characteristic pattern, uh, certainly across the Pacific or across, um, or across the Eurasian continent. So the major driver to get these SSWs is to force wave flux into the stratosphere. So we want a lot of convergent wave flux, so a lot of heat flux, um, and, also to, and also to pump momentum out. So here I'm showing the uh, vertical component of the Elias and Palm flux averaged between 40 and 80 north. And again, day zero is the day of the major sun stratospheric warming event, negative lags before it. So the black line is from observations 
and you can see that we get major flux roughly uh, between uh, day minus five and day minus three, but you can see that we already have evidence of increased flux that go back to almost day minus 20. So again, some of these kind of precursor kind of signals of these sort of pulses that go in, up, up into the atmosphere uh, during that time. Um, for the models, uh, we can see that the Canadian models do get this uh, big pulse, of course, that, that happens. The gray lines are the different ensemble members, and you can see that, you know, they're spread, but overall, I think we do see this, this big pulse. Maybe some signs of a little bit of enhanced going on here at day minus 20 to minus 15, um, but not, certainly not as much as the observation, certainly not in the magnitude at all. The Canadian uh, CM3 model, though, I, I don't know what to say. Um, I've looked at it. There's just no wave flux that, that, that goes up for these events. So something's happening internally within the vortex, I guess, to break it down uh, within that model. So the post impact. So these are days plus 5 to plus 60. So 5 to 60 days after the major warming, what does the 500 millibar map look like um, in the troposphere? And so you can see on the right, we get our negative NAM. Whoops, sorry about that. We get our negative NAM signature, so ne definitely a negative NAO signature, higher pressure building uh, throughout the Pacific. In the models, uh, we do get, again, the two Canadian models are getting the negative uh, AO signal. The problem is, is that in the Pacific, they have completely opposite type of pattern. Strong low pressure builds across the uh, from the CAN-CM4, whereas there's some signature of neutral, maybe slightly higher pressure across from the Canadian CM3. Again, the CCSM4 just has a, there's nothing coherent there. Uh, you might argue maybe a negative NAO pattern, but uh, it looks, it, nothing looks uh, really that great in that, in that model. Now, this low pressure here across the Canadian, from the CAN-CM4 versus the higher or neutral pressure actually is going to impact temperature forecasts, especially across North America. So these are the composite surface temperatures occurring five to 60 days after a sunrise for warming event. You can see in the observations from that negative NAN signature, we're getting cold air that filters down across Northern Europe, uh, much of Northern and Central Eurasia, and then diving across much of Central, Northern and Central North America here. In the models though, if we compare the Canadian and the CM4, we get the cold across Europe uh, and, and Eurasia. Um, but North America is very different. So North America here for the CAN-CM3, we get the colder kind of conditions similar to the era interim, whereas we get a warmer, actually a much warmer signal, some cold here across the Ohio Valley into New England, but overall North America is much warmer. And I think that has to do with, again, this uh, low, low pressure pumping uh, mild air across for the, from the, from the CAN-CM4. Uh, the CCSM, Four model, uh, again, cold dump into Eurasia, but warm in Europe and much, lots of warmth across uh, North America. And so again, if we look at these dripping paint plots, uh, so again, these are sort of like those Baldwin and Dunkerton plots. Here's from the era interim plot, and what we can see is we see the characteristic downward uh, propagating signal from the stratosphere uh, into, into, the, into the troposphere there. But if we do the same for the models, um, the CAN-CM3 has almost nothing that gets below 50 millibars. Uh, the CAN-CM4 does fairly well compared to the era interim, but the CCSM4 um, also has a downward propagating signal but has a halt and stops uh, pretty much at the, at the tropopause here. So we're not getting that downward propagation in these models, um, and certainly not from the CAN-CM3. Um, that's just not happening. Um, so the final thing that I just um, want to cover here, oh, this is just another way to look at it, sorry. Um, so this is looking at the AO index, um, so that surface index, zero to 60 days after major warming. And so you can see in the observations, we get this negative tendency that happens, like the dripping paint plot, but in the, observ in the models, uh, perhaps the CCSM4 has a little bit of a negative tendency, but overall very neutral. Uh, so we're not, again, this is just another way of showing that that dripping paint is not occurring. And so the last thing, this is the, um, I only have uh, two more slides. Um, the last thing here is sort of getting at what, why don't we see the jet stream shifting in the troposphere from that, you know, wh wh why aren't we seeing that? And so one way we're trying to look at that is looking at through the wave fluxes. So what I'm showing here is the anomalous um, divergence of the EP flux. So this is directly proportional to the um, acceleration of zonal mean zonal wind. 
Um, so positive values here is the meters per second per day. And again, this is five to 30 days after major warming. And so you can see at the high latitudes, the vortex is recovering, it's speeding back up. In the troposphere, we're getting actually significant divergence at lower latitudes, which would mean sort of a, a way of diagnosing that the jet stream is being displaced towards the equator. We're getting you know, stronger zonal mean zonal wind flow uh, southward to 30 to 40 north. But in the models, uh, not seeing that. So the CAN-CM3 has the completely opposite pattern, uh, has uh, convergence actually in the, in the um, stratosphere. Um, whereas the CAN-CM4 and CCSM4 have the recovery go on, which we expect, but in the troposphere, we don't see that very strong divergence happening. And in fact, here in the CCSM4, we're actually seeing a little bit of convergence um, within, within that, that area. So this is just a quick summary of what I discussed. And again, the ongoing work right now is looking at observed SSW. So going, taking the observed from the reanalysis and going in and trying to see if the models predict to them and um, what the skill scores are with that. So that's what's going on right now. And now that we have the, you know, as complete of a data set as we'll get from the model output. Um, and then we're gonna be looking at case studies to really try to hone in on those wave propagation biases that I think we're seeing in the models. And hopefully that'll help to maybe understand why we're seeing some of these biases and that the lack of the downward propagation. So I'll end it there. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. Great, Jason. Um, very comprehensive, lots of great results there. Uh, so I'll open up for questions. And it looks like Michelle LaRue has a question. Go ahead, Michelle. Uh, so can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, Jason, that was a really interesting presentation. I, I must admit I'm, I'm surprised to see how well the surface temperature structure and also the post uh, sudden stratospheric warming circulation pattern emerges. So you're almost suggesting here that it doesn't need to get the stratospheric processes correct in order to still attain the, the tropospheric um, post sudden stratospheric warming impacts. I mean, that's particularly evident with the Canadian uh, CCM3 model, which doesn't get any of the precursor wave um, forcing. Right. Uh, yes, but it still mimics a lot of these growth features. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, and I think this is why we have to. I have to really go in, even in the modeled cases. I think I'd like to look at a couple of the, you know specific sun stratospheric warming events from the simulated cases and see what, what's happening at the surface. Um, you know, these are, the, the, the plots I showed here are, you know, the, the average of all of them, so the average of um, all of them. But I wonder if individual cases, maybe, you know, maybe there's a real strong tendency of one versus another. But that's, a, that's an excellent point, uh, especially for the CAN-CM3 model. Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. And there's another question from Bill Merrifield. Bill, go ahead. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, Bill Merrifield from Environment Canada. Hi, Jason. Um, yeah, there uh, there is one model, not in MME, in MME that um, does uh, uh, particularly well, better than any any others. In fact, for predicting the uh, NAO at least, and that is the uh, UK Met Office uh, GLOSI five model. So it would be very interesting to see these you know metrics applied uh, to their system, which has. Uh, quite a bit higher resolution, uh, um, both horizontal and vertical, than, than most others, and also in the ocean. It would be uh, very nice to see how the uh, the, the dripping paint uh, manifests in that system and some of these other uh, diagnostics. So I, I don't know if you've uh, had any communication uh, with uh, uh, with uh, people at the Met Office on this. Um, thanks. Thanks for the comment. Um, I've I've I haven't present I haven't shown this specific work, but I have. I have spoken with um, Adam Scaife about about the model there, um, but yeah, it would be really interesting. I think um, maybe worth pursuing, seeing if we can get some of these diagnostics from from their model. Um, I imagine maybe they've done some of this, but maybe not with some of these same same sort of metrics. But that's a good point. Thanks. Thanks, Bill. Uh, are there any questions in the room? Um, Jason, I just have a question. Did you have you looked at the wave fluxes uh, from a regional standpoint, or are you just taking zonal means or looking at it um, in a band? 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, the, the, I have, I've actually computed both. I've, I, right now I presented the, um, the, just the uh, EP fluxes, so those are zonally averaged. Um, I do have, though, the regional, so the, the sort of 3D lat lawn um, wave activity fluxes, um, and I don't have those plots today, but I do have several plots where I'm looking at that to see if we, if the source regions are the, are the same. So that's, that's on the list too. <laughs> now that I have okay. the answer. Great. Hey, thanks so much, Jason. Yep. yep. Okay, and so for our last presentation today, um, let me just bring up the presentation. And that will be uh, by uh, Dr. David DeWitt, uh, who has um, served as the director of the Climate Prediction Center at uh, the National Weather Service since 2014. And uh, David joined the National Weather Service in 2012 as the lead modeler within the science plans branch of the Office of Science and Technology. Prior to coming to NOAA, uh, he worked as a research scientist at the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, or IRI, at Columbia University from 1999 to 2012. And while at IRI, David led a team of scientists in the development of seasonal climate forecasts and prototype decision support systems for the application of climate information in the fields of agriculture, health, and water resources. And then before that, um, uh, David worked at COLA, uh, developing coupled atmosphere ocean models for seasonal forecasts and conducting research to better understand short-term climate variability. Uh, he received his uh, Bachelor of Arts uh, degrees in meteorology from Keene University and his master's and PhD uh, in meteorology from the University of Maryland College Park. And I just want to make sure, David, that you are unmuted. I think you are unmuted. So, uh, yep. Can you can hear me? Yep, we can hear you, so I'll drive. Oh, I got to so, share my yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll uh, go out here and uh, be a little adventurous. So if I click share in theory, then I'll get control. Is that right? Yeah, I have it up. Um, do you want to have control? <laughs> yeah, let me try. Let's see how that goes. If I break it, I apologize. So let's no. see. Uh, now it's not letting me do it. Uh, do I have control? Hello? Not good. Hello? Not good. Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, yeah, sorry. Sorry, Dave. Somehow I put myself on mute there on the computer. So, oh, that's yeah, we okay. Can see, yeah, we can okay, see your so, screen now. And you can hear me. Yep, go for it whenever okay. you're ready. Okay, all right, go ahead, great. Then I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so thanks for the um, opportunity to speak. I enjoyed the other three um, presentations uh, given so far. So I should say perhaps a little preamble before we start. Obviously, the uh, CPC has been involved with the NMME from the beginning. Uh, we have benefited tremendously from uh, the project, and uh, I'm going to speak about some of the ways that we use the NMME in our operational um, forecasts here at CPC. Um, as you'll see on the outline, if I could, let's see, yeah, uh, at the end, hey, I'm Dave? also actually going to talk, yes. Yeah, can you maybe make it full uh, in um, presentation mode there, just so we can, uh, no. uh, let's see. So there should be, bottom uh, right. uh, yeah, the bottom right, to 170. yeah, yeah. Uh, no, uh, just no, a little higher in your PowerPoint, right, right next to where it's giving you the um, how zoomed in you are, the zoom in factor there. Right next yeah. to the number one hundred. Yeah. Right there. Yep, yeah, you got it. Uh, great. great. Thank Thanks. You. Okay. Yep. See. You. Thank you. All right. Yeah. So um, as I was saying, uh, so I'll speak about um, you know how we use uh, the NMME for several sample products, including our monthly and seasonal temperature and precipitation outlooks as well as in support of the ENSO diagnostic discussion, uh, the drought outlook, as well as activities at the international desks. None of those will be comprehensive. Also talk a little bit about our uh, philosophy on the use of multimodal ensembles and the CPC temperature and precipitation outlooks, how we actually formulate those, what's the process, and how NMME fits in there. But I'm also going to talk about challenges and gaps. And anyone who's heard a talk I've given in the last two years, I think we're at a fundamental point in time 
similar to what happened in 97, 98. Unfortunately, in 97, 98, I think a decision was made or some people believe that because of the success associated with the 97, 98 event that dynamical models were perfect and we didn't need to invest a lot of money in them and that forecast skill was going to be great and uh, the honey and candy was going to roll. And unfortunately, I think the last two to three years have shown that that's not the case, especially with precipitation. And I think it's incumbent on us to make sure that people realize, and, and um, when I say people, especially people who do things like write budgets and um, lobby Congress understand that the fundamental tools are tremendous achievements and do a lot of things, but uh, there's certainly room for improvement. And the only way that we're actually going to make uh, significant improvement in forecast skill is if we actually make investments in the building blocks associated with those models. So I hope people give me some forbearance on that. All right, so um, again, in terms of uh, why we use multi-model ensembles uh, for forecast in general and CPC in particular, uh, obviously it allows the representation of the model uncertainty. Also, we can leverage a possibility of complementary skill between the models. Also, it's generally true that the skill of the multi-model ensemble is higher than that from the most skillful member, but that's not always the case. And so I think that is actually an interesting research area that probably needs more concentration than it's received to date. Um, so next slide. So in terms of the generation of the CPC monthly and seasonal outlooks, we have a human forecaster over the loop process. And the forecasters use various tools to make the monthly and seasonal outlook. Uh, the criteria we use for determining if we will use a tool is if it has a credible scientific basis for the predictive skill of the tool, as well as a suitable period of hindcast so that we can evaluate the potential skill of the tool in a rigorous cross-validated way. Our goal of using these different tools is to leverage complementary skill between the tools. Ultimately, the skill of our monthly and seasonal forecast depends on the skill of the tools that we make available to the forecaster. So essentially, the paradigm that we view for forecasting here at CPC is that we have tools that give us a baseline skill level and then the human forecast to provide some epsilon uh, or delta on top of that skill level from the tools. So here, uh, if you're not familiar with what our monthly seasonal outlooks look like, this is the format. It's given in uh, tercile probabilities or probabilities for the above normal, near normal, and below normal categories. The maps actually show the dominant tercile category. Uh, but I do want to mention here that we have two exciting new tools that are available. One builds on the seminal work of Tony Barnston uh, many years ago to develop a probability of exceedance tool. The problem with the tool that Tony developed is that it's extremely hard for users to understand and therefore use. So um, Matt Rosenkrantz um, and Jamal West and some other folks, uh, Dave Strout, have developed an interactive probability of exceedance tool so that the user can roll their own risk threshold and, and more easily get um, probability information for what that particular outcome is. You can also invert it the other way. Um, the second exciting tool um, that will be available soon is a version of the so-called Pendleton tool that allows the user to select a particular climate division and see what all three tercile categories are for a particular forecast. So for instance, when you would click, you would get a pie chart for this region and you would actually be able to see that, you know, for in this case, uh, for over Maine, that it's uh, normal for, or uh, equiprobable for each of the categories. If you were to click on Texas, you would see that, uh, or this, this particular area in Texas, that it's uh, above normal at 50%, near normal at 33%, and below normal at 17%. And so, you know, people, um, I think, are aware, or some are aware that CPC is engaging in um, social science uh, work these days with um, some great experts from Kix Maryland, for instance, um, Melissa Kenny and her group, in order to try to make our outlooks more useful. And one of the things we have learned from those folks, as well as from other sources, is that people want to see the full PDF. Um, looking at the static map, just having um, the dominant category frequently confuses people because they're not always factoring in what the other two categories are. And especially in small shifts that we see in climatological uh, forecast, or, or sorry, small shifts from climatology that we see in our standard forecast, frequently not knowing that, um, for instance, if you have a 40% probability of 
above, but it's 33% of normal, and then one minus the sum of those four uh, above normal, then, you know, you're going to be in a position where you might make a, a bad decision on that forecast because you didn't realize that it's really a small shift in the PDF. So in terms of um, how the forecasters actually use the NMME, this is, uh, for those of you unfamiliar with how CPC forecasters make the monthly and seasonal outlook, this is what I'll call a billboard diagram. This gives the dominant tools that the CPC forecasters use when they're constructing the forecast. Uh, and so you see, for instance, on the upper column, or sorry, the upper row, those are statistical forecast tools that we use. The bottom row, uh, except for the bottom right-hand corner, are dynamical models we use. And, of course, in the lower left-hand corner is the NMME, probabilistic forecast. Uh, the bottom right corner is an objective consolidation among several of our tools. Uh, CFS uh, V2 forecast is over here. Its skill is over here. So the forecasters are mentally integrating a, a lot of these tools as they're formulating the forecast. They're also looking at the previous forecast given here in the old outlook to formulate what will be the new outlook. And uh, again, the consolidation is an objective merger of several of our statistical, and, and at that time this was plotted, one of the dynamical models, which is the CFS. We're actually making a new objective consolidation that will use the NMME in place of the CFS um, within the consolidation. So we also uh, spend a lot of time uh, looking at the NMME uh, from several different uh, perspectives, uh, given, again, that it is frequently the most skillful tool that we have these days. So um, this is a plot from our web page that has been, um, the web page has been maintained uh, and improved over the years, um, largely due to the efforts of Emily Becker. And so here you see the deterministic forecast from the individual um, NMME models, as well as in the lower right-hand corner, the uh, deterministic forecast um, from the IMME model, which essentially is the European Center, CFSV2, and Medio France. And then uh, we have the actual ensemble mean deterministic forecast from all of the models in the upper left-hand corner. We have the NMME probabilistic forecast in the uh, middle column on the top row. And then we have uh, a new tool that I'll talk about briefly later, which is the calibrated probabilistic forecast from the NMMEs using probability anomaly correlation technique that was developed here by Hoog Van den Duel. And this, in this particular case, this is the January 2017 forecast from December initial conditions. Uh, for people who are familiar with this, and I'll talk more about this again in the challenges section, forecasting um, pretty significant below normal precipitation over California, even as record floods were observed. So uh, one of the other ways we use the NMME, and this is a relatively recent uh, tool that has been developed by Chin Zhang and Dan Collins, which combines the NMME forecast models with several statistical models that we use here at CPC. This is for the Nino 3.4 index. Uh, and the nice feature about this, it's complementary to the IRI CPC and so Plume, which has more models, but which isn't available until later in the month. This product is available earlier in the month, thus allowing its use in the El Nino diagnostic discussion, which goes out on the, um, typically on the second Thursday of the month. So uh, another way that we use the NMME data, uh, or another product that we use the NMME data for uh, at CPC is uh, informing the seasonal and monthly drought outlooks, which are given in the bottom here. Uh, this product is released on the third Thursday of the month, the seasonal outlook associated with our seasonal temperature and precipitation outlooks, and the monthly drought outlook is issued actually on the last day of the month for the next month, and this is just some historical evolution of how our products evolved uh, to get to the current situation with the monthly and seasonal drought outlook. So um, one of the primary ways that we use the NMME data to inform the monthly and seasonal out, uh, drought outlook, excuse me, is um, through development of the standardized precipitation index, both the SPI-3, which is the three-month version, and the SPI-6, which is the six-month version. Uh, and these particular tools have been developed by um, Kinsey Mo uh, and in association with um, some of the contractors who work with her who have been funded over the years from uh, the Climate Program Office. 
So uh, the international desks here at uh, CPC make several uses of the NMME. Uh, the first one is to inform the famine early warning system uh, products that we produce uh, for USAID. Uh, the second way is we have a website of global products that give um, deterministic and probabilistic forecasts um, for uh, many different regions around the globe. These are used to inform both the famine early warning system products as well as products for the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance as well as other uses. Uh, in terms of the probabilistic forecast products, I do note that these are not very heavily post-processed for the most part. They're really mostly ensemble counting. Uh, while Phil has corrected me recently, there is a little bit of, of post-processing, um, and uh, if you're interested in that, I recommend that you either get on our website uh, and or contact Wasilla. We also use the MME data as part of our um, capacity building and training activities here at the desk where visitors come for a four-month period. They're given an educational curriculum. Uh, they get a mentor. Uh, and they learn how to use um, U.S.-based and now because of the NMME, U.S. and Canadian-based data in order to provide forecasts for their own region as well as they frequently will develop some sort of uh, special statistical tool or an ensemble post-process tool for their home region. So uh, if you go to the CPC International Desks, you'll see this very impressive front end where you can click and point, or point and click, sorry, and get uh, various forecasts from the NME, both in terms of probabilistic and deterministic measures. You can get the skill maps uh, on the deterministic. I'd like to see us develop this so that you could get the skill maps on the probabilistic side, and I'm going to work with Wasilla to see if we can do that in the near-term future. Um, so in terms of sample products, again, this is just one of them. So on the left, you see um, the standard turf file probabilistic forecasts from the NMME. In this case, it's for um, South America. Just the actually recent forecast from February initial conditions for the March to May period. And on the right is um, the forecast for the same time period for South America, pardon me, and it's for the departure from the climatological probabilities uh, using some calibration that they do uh, with observed data as well. So, um, you know, we're always looking to improve our products here at CPC, and that includes uh, improvement of the foundational tools, such as the NMME or, or the products that we derive from the NMME. And so two examples of how we've done that recently. The first one is the development of calibrated forecasts using the probability anomaly correlation. We also more recently have been exploring um, the use of unequal weights to see if we can maximize skill. The first part, the PAC calibrated forecast, that project is done. You, know, you saw an example of that earlier. That's used operationally. We're still in debate and discussion about the results from the unequal weights project and whether or not we would uh, adopt that operationally in the future. So. Um, and again, so here's the sort of improvement that you would expect to get from the PAC or probability anomaly correlation calibration technique. On the right there, you see the uh, reliability diagrams, and uh, the top panel is the uncalibrated for uh, northern hemisphere land, and you see the, the typical laying over curve indicating uh, that the probabilities are not very reliable. Uh, the bottom curve there shows the calibrated forecasts, and they are quite reliable, as you see that the lines lie directly on the diagonal, so that the uh, percent of time that you forecast a, a certain probability matches the percent of time that it's observed uh, in the observational data set. And I'll give a plug that this project actually uh, led by Hoog van den Duel, um, and Emily Becker was a member uh, or a uh, project that came through the climate test bed. So, uh, again, now coming to the challenges as I see them, uh, and so, excuse me, um, you know, as, as the director of CPC, I think it's a strategic priority for us as well as the larger enterprise to continually engage in objective evaluation of how well the forecast and input tools are doing, and I will offer the following that I think needless to say, forecasts of precipitation for the western U.S. over the last three years especially from dynamical models, not just the NMME, these are the European models as well. It's left a lot to be desired. So I think there are three possibilities for why these forecasts have not been what we might have expected or hoped. So the first one is uh, you could 
estimate or guess that there's less predictability in the system than we previously believed. Uh, you could hypothesize that the current generation of models misrepresent or don't represent at all key processes. Or you could uh, perhaps believe that the force signal is overwhelmed by the atmospheric transients. And so I view this and have viewed this as an opportunity, a golden opportunity, in fact, for our community, the short-term climate community, short-term climate forecasting community, excuse me, to explore these issues to see if this actually was predictable, and if so, why our tools fell short. And so um, going back to the example I used earlier, um, around 1999, based on what were very successful predictions for the record 1997-98 El Nino and the 1999 La Nina, then CPC Director Hans Lietma declared that the seasonal prediction problem was solved, and unfortunately this has proven not to be the case. And again, I think that had direct impacts on the amount of money and effort we invested in improving the models, okay? So I'm going to provide a quote that hopefully proves true um, 18 years from now is that we need strategic investment in the most promising tools to push the sub-seasonal to seasonal skill envelope, and there's plenty of room for improvement in these tools. Um, and so I'm going to give some examples of that and some challenges that I think we need to address. And so the first one, uh, and I apologize, I know a lot of people have seen these, but no one has fixed this yet, so we got to get on this, right? So if you look at the historical forecast skill from the NMME models for the January, February, March, sea surface temperature, the time when we expect the strongest teleconnection from the tropics to the mid-latitudes, especially from the tropical Indian and Pacific Ocean to North America, there is virtually no skill in the Western Pacific or Eastern Indian Ocean where we know that there are massive convection anomalies that drive global circulation anomalies. And again, so this is actually the 25, 28-year-plus retrospective forecast period um, for all of these models for a one-month lead. So no, no forecast skill to speak of in this region. So again, I'm just going to give some examples where the precipitation forecast over the West um, has left a lot to be desired, and this is the first example. And so um, First of three examples, actually, and so uh, I think it's fair to ask, and we can have a philosophical debate uh, about the fact that in this case, on the left you'll see the NME probabilistic forecast, and on the right you see the observed precipitation rate. So you're getting modest probabilities of above normal uh, over California um, in the forecast, and an observed forecast is uh, record drought, and so that's a two-class miss. Okay, and so how many times do you expect a uh, state-of-the-art forecast system to have a two-class miss, and how many times does it need to miss before we believe that there are problems with the physical representations in the model? And I would say that we've seen enough examples of this over the past two and a half years that we clearly have problems with the models, that it can't be explained simply as atmospheric noise, that there are large-scale atmospheric structures in the circulation that we are not getting correct. So here's another example. This is the forecast for December 2015, a one-month lead, and you see the same sort of thing. Uh, NMME is on the bottom, observed is on the top. You see below normal forecast over California, uh, observes obviously above normal for, uh, precipitation over northern California. Forecast in the model is for above normal forecast for southern, above normal precipitation for southern California. It's below normal precipitation for southern California in the observations. And a broader point is that the whole structure actually of this precipitation anomaly is wrong all the way from New Mexico up to Washington State. Similar, again, uh, for the record El Nino, January, February, March 2015, 2016, same thing, NME forecasting way above normal precipitation down into Southern uh, California, below normal precipitation up above the Northwest, Oregon, Washington State, extending out into Washington, Idaho, exactly the opposite pattern of what we see in observations. So the final example here will be the one that we just finished in January 2017. Uh, and here we see that the NMME again struggles to correctly capture the precipitation signal in the Western U.S. Uh, where the deterministic NME forecasts drought, the probabilistic NME forecasts near normal to drought, and the actual precipitation is near record floods. And so, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we're going to need to improve 
uh, our forecasting systems. And I think that, you know, needless to say, stakeholders, and I can tell you that I talk to a stakeholder associated with Western Water probably on the order of once a week, and during a major event like January, I may talk to four or five of them. And some of these folks are connected to places like the Western States Water Council and the California Department of Water Resources. And to be frank, they're not particularly happy with some of the recent forecasts, and you know, and it's understandable why. And I think they appreciate the fact that it's a technological challenge, and we need to take it seriously and invest money um, and resources in order to try to improve this. And so I think we probably need to take a step back and start to think about why we might be having this problem. And so I'll put forward the following hypothesis that in order to actually get short-term climate, we actually need to represent the weather systems with fidelity. Note that I'm not saying that we need to be able to forecast the weather perfectly because we know by Lorenzian chaotic dynamics you can't do that. However, if you have a 50-kilometer model with poor parameterization, it's highly unlikely that the tropical cyclones that you're modeling and or the atmospheric rivers bear much fidelity to actual reality. So if we're actually going to be able to do this at a level that can inform society for these really important challenges like Western states precipitation, I think we need to go to something that we know improves weather forecasts. And again, I'm using the paradigm here of saying by improving the weather forecast at the short time scale, we know that we're getting the systems better. But we can learn a lesson from that by actually using the same tool book or recipe to actually improve our short-term climate forecast. And I'll throw in that actually initialization is important uh, because the first couple of weeks, the first week three, four, and the first month are going to be influenced. Even the first season is going to have some influence from those initial conditions. And if you're getting nonlinear feedback through things like sea ice as well as soil moisture, those initial conditions could actually be pretty important. And so the playbook that's been shown again and again, and I'll close by showing a slide that every major weather service in the world shows in terms of how they've improved their forecast system, we need to drive towards increased resolution, improved physics, and improved initialization through better data assimilation. And so this is a diagram. This, in this case, is uh, for the GFS model from NCEP. And what you see is the 500 millibar anomaly correlation above a certain threshold as a function of time, percentage of the good forecast. You could invert this and look at the percentage of the, of the bad forecast, which goes down. And what you see is that as you're increasing the resolution in blue, you're getting these bump ups in skill. As you're increasing and improving the physics, you're getting bump ups that you're seeing in green, and the same with the data assimilation. And so I think essentially, this problem is one that we actually have to address from improving the building blocks. And so the challenge or the tension that we have is how much effort do you spend improving a single best model as opposed to investing the same amount of resources in many different models? And given where we are in terms of the budgets, in terms of computing, can a whole bunch of lower resolution models um, that are, are not as good with respect to the physics and not as good with the initialization, are you better off to invest in that or are you better off to invest in a few better models and really improve their resolution, really improve their physics, really improve their assimilation system? And the thing about that is that here we have an ideal paradigm where we're, for instance, partnering with our Canadian colleagues. So in Canada, Canada is investing its money in improving their models. The U.S. can invest in improving our models, and I think, you know, we need to start as a uh, community here looking at what makes the most sense strategically. Is it strategic to invest in as many models as possible or to, few, to choose a few best models and develop those in order to ultimately accelerate and improve forecast skill to a high enough level that stakeholders, for instance, in the water resources community can use those models to inform their decisions. And, and that's not saying in any way that, that activities like the NMME are not good and are not what we need to do. It really is an issue of where do we prioritize, right? So it's possible that the NMME provides certain, certain um, tools that are useful for certain products, but that ultimately if we're going to do things like water resource management, that we actually need to invest in, in a, a fewer set of models and really crank up the resolution, 
crank up the physics development and crank up the data assimilation. So I think that's my last slide and I'm done. I'm happy to take questions. Great, Dave. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, very nice discussion of your operational process and uh, all the science issues you face. And uh, um, so are there any questions from the audience? And just, you know, Whit Anderson at DFDL is, is virtually applauding you. So, um, <laughs> there's a, yeah. He's looking for a virtual applause button. So I don't see any questions coming in. Um, oh, yeah, Anish uh, has a question. Let me. Anish, uh, yeah. I think we can, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, we hear you. Go ahead. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. It was an excellent and provocative talk. I had a question on your previous slide where you listed increased resolution, improved physics, and improved data assimilation, where in the increased re resolution seems more of a resource problem that if you have a larger supercomputer where you have to invest money to buy a supercomputer, you can achieve that e easier than improving the physics, which is more of a science problem, and improved data assimilation seems more of a good observations and a technical challenge of getting better data assimilation algorithms. So in your opinion, which how would you prioritize these three in yeah, so good, good, good question. So I, I think, you know, the, the common paradigm people will use is it's three legs on a stool, and if you don't do all three, you have a problem. But I, I'll step back and say that, you know, from, from my perspective, I think perhaps the most important one, uh, and actually you can't, I really, you really can't separate the physics from the resolution. So we need to drive the resolution, uh, and that will necessitate, necessitate, excuse me, changes in the physics. And part of the reason I say that, and I thought Kathy Pajan had done a, a very nice talk earlier, and she and Parshant had done some very, what I always thought was innovative work with respect to um, predictability studies that was very different than the standard uh, idealized predictability. But if, let's take an analog, which is the severe weather community. When severe weather folks were running 25 kilometer models, okay, um, you couldn't really resolve tornadoes, and so they could have done idealized predictability studies that would have said there is no predictability. When they got down to about five kilometers, all of a sudden it was possible to model tornadoes, and now that we're at approximately the two to three kilometer range, you can see that we can model tornadoes. Again, much shorter lead time. So if you do predictability studies now with a sufficiently high resolution, you can see that there actually is predictability, and so the one thing I have as a personal uh, issue is that I think a lot of the predictability studies that we're doing, and again, it's necessary, but I think that the course resolution models that we currently have available to us that don't resolve the physical phenomena well enough, including, in fact, the land-sea boundary in a place like California and the topography, that the predictability studies that we're doing with those models are probably of extremely limited value. So the short answer is, we need to drive resolution, and physics will need to come along at the same time. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Anish. Uh, Bill, I see your, Bill Maryfield, I see your hand is still raised, but I assume that's from earlier. Um, oh, Kathy has a question or comment. Go ahead. I would reply to uh, Dave and just say that I don't disagree with you. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Okay, well, um, if there are no other questions, I'll just thank um, the four speakers again for four really great talks across the board, the three research talks, uh, very different research areas using enemy data, um, uh, just a, a great breath of work being done. And uh, Dave, thanks very much for the provocative talk. and. Uh, very comprehensive. So thanks all for your time and uh, stay tuned for uh, the posting of this webinar on our webpage as well as the PDF there and um, for the next enemy or for the next MAP webinar which I think is coming up uh, a couple weeks. in a couple weeks from now. All right? March 13th. March 13th. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. All right, thanks. thanks. Thank you.
Thanks. Bye.